All right. We're back. How are you guys doing? OK? All right. So actually, uh, we have some interesting stuff coming up this week. Um, we'll talk about, today, we'll talk about directional derivatives. And then on Thursday, we'll talk about maximum and minimum functions. So this, you know, we're getting to some more interesting um, parts of this course. So the first topic today is directional derivatives. Very, very lively today. That's, that's good. So, but let's focus, OK? Directional derivatives. We, talk, we have talked about partial derivatives, OK? If you have a function and two variables, it's natural to differentiate with respect to each of the two variables, x or y, right? And we've done that, and that's what we've called uh, partial derivatives. We call them f sub x, or also df dx, and also f sub y, df dy. And now the question is, is there anything else that we can say about derivatives for functions in more than one variable, like function two variables? So to answer that, we have to remember what is a derivative. What does it represent? Okay. And derivative represents the rate of change. Change we can believe in, right? <laughs> People seem to, seem to have forgotten that one, you know? But um, a year ago, it was all the rage. Um, so derivative, in general, is the rate of change. What do I mean by this? Let's say, let's say you're crossing a street, OK? And you see that there's a car. You don't want to be hit by a car. So you try to estimate how much time you have to cross the street, right? So what do you estimate? You don't estimate the distance, right? You estimate the distance divided by time. You, do, you estimate how, how quickly it's coming, right? Because so your, our brain is wired so that even without thinking about it, we are, we are watching you know, how it moves and what is the distance that it covers in, in, a, in, a, in a given, you know, short period of time. And that gives us an idea how fast it will be here. And we want to make sure that it won't be here while we are crossing, right? So if it's going too fast, we'll wait. And, well, some people will go anyway, but <laughs> this you shouldn't. So you wait. And if it's going slowly, then you, then you cross, right? So what you're interested in is the rate of change. Is the rate of change of what? Of the distance. How quickly how quickly is it approaching you, the car, in this particular case, right? And that's what we call the velocity, right? So the velocity is really the ratio between distance and uh, traveled and the time that was required to travel that distance. But you can measure it over one second or, you know, 10 seconds and so on. But if you want to, if you want to estimate the kind of instantaneous velocity, you want to measure it over a very short period of time, right? right. One tenth of a second, one hundredth of a second. So what you really want to do is take the limit when the time becomes very, very short, goes to zero, of the, of the ratio of the distance traveled and the time. And that's, that's a derivative, right? So the derivative is the instantaneous rate of change at that very moment. That's why we study derivatives in the first place, because it gives us an idea of the rate of change at a given moment. And also, as we, we've learned, this is the first step in doing linear approximation when we have a complicated function and we try to, to approximate it by a linear function. In the first approximation, when we look at that car, we are approximating its, its movement as a, as, a, as a movement at constant speed, even though we realize that it actually can go faster and slower. But we are, we are trained to first, in the first approximation, that's what we call first approximation, we look at the instantaneous speed of that car. In other words, we are approximating its, its movement by a straight line movement, by a line at a constant, with constant velocity. 
Okay? So that's why the first derivative is important. It gives us information about this first approximation. But the, the bottom line is that the derivative is the rate of change. So when we have a function in one variable, it's very clear what the derivative should be. It will just be, there's only one choice. We have to look at the, if you have a function in one variable, you can just take you know, df dx. Right? So that's the limit when of the ratio of the increment in the function over the increment of the argument when the, the increment of the argument goes to zero. Questions? No? OK. But if you have a function in two variables, right, there is no obvious choice for, for that. You can take the limit, you can divide, you can, you can take the limit of the ratio by delta x or delta y, for example. And that's how we get the partial derivatives. In other words, in order to define a derivative, we have to say rate of change with respect to what? Right? There is a rate of change with respect to x, and there is a rate of change with respect to y. And these are a priori two different rates of change. That's how we get these two different derivatives. But now let us think about it geometrically. So here, the x, here is the xy plane. And here is our point. And so we have a function on, on, in two variables which assigns to each point on this plane a certain number. This is what we call f, f of xy. If you have a point xy, this function assigns to it a value f of xy. Right? And so now we are trying to see how this function changes with respect to uh, one of the two variables. And the way you can think about it geometrically, let me draw it like this, you can try to move away from this point along the x-axis or in the direction of x, right? And you can see how the function changes with respect to when you do that. So let's say if, you, if this is x and this is x plus delta x, right? So then you would have f of x plus delta x, y, minus f of x divided by delta x. So this looks like this. Looks like this. I wrote it. I call this delta f because if you have a function in one variable, there is no ambiguity. But now let's rewrite this in a, in a more similar form, f of x plus delta x minus f of x divided by delta x. So you see this, this ratio is very similar to this ratio. But now here you have a function which you evaluate at x plus delta x and also evaluate at x. You take the difference, divide by delta x. Here you only increase one of the variables, x by delta x, but you keep y fixed, which was, of course, the rule we followed when we calculate partial derivative. We said we fix the y variable, right? We freeze the y variable, and then we just change the x one, the x variable. So this is very similar, but we've made a choice. Geometrically, the choice is moving along the x-axis. And then if we take the limit of this, when delta x goes to 0, that's, that's the first partial derivative. Right? This is f sub x, df dx at this point. Right? To get this, this, the second partial derivative, we would go in this direction. So then this would be y. And this would be del, uh, y plus delta, delta y. So we would, um, we would write df dy as the limit when delta y goes to 0 of f of x y plus delta y minus f of x y divided by delta y. So here we freeze the first variable, but we are, we are changing the second variable. And we look at the rate of change as we do that. And algebraically, it looks like that's all we can do, because there are only two variables. So we can, do the, we can calculate the rate of change with respect to the first variable or the second. But if you look at it geometrically, which is why I drew this picture, you see that these two vectors are just two possible directions in which you can move away from this point. Right? How about, how about moving in this direction? Or in this direction? 
or in this direction. Geometrically, it seems clear that all of them you know, are meaningful, have the right to exist, and we should uh, you know, understand what happens uh, in, in, in uh, each of these directions. In other words, it is only an illusion that there are these two preferred directions, this one and this one. In fact, there are many more. Okay? And just like, we could cal just like we could calculate the rate of change in the direction of x or in the direction of y, we could and should also be able to calculate the rate of change in, uh, in any direction. So of course, uh, then uh, you can ask, why, is that, why should we do that? Why is that interesting? That's the next question. In other words, what are the applications of that? We'll talk about this. But for now, I just want to set up the, uh, the procedure and, set, and, and introduce this concept and this is the concept of directional derivative. It's a rate of change in a more general direction than x and y. That's what it is. So how do we go about calculating this? And what is the result? So first of all, we have to choose a direction vector. Rate of change with respect to what direction? So I have to choose direction vector uh, vector and so that's a vector on the plane right so that's going to be a vector of the form a b or if you want uh, a i plus b j so say that this vector would have two components x and y and this would be a and this would be b now, if I take a proportional vector, if I take a vector in the same direction, but multiply it by, by, by a certain number, I would get the same direction, right? So in a way, we don't want to consider all possible directions, we, all possible vectors. We really are, care about the direction rather than the vector itself. So what we should do is amongst all vectors pointing in this direction, we should choose one, okay? And of course, there is a natural way to do that, We'll just choose a vector which has length one or norm one. So let's assume uh, assume that the norm norm or length, whatever you like to call it, is one. What does it mean? It means that the square root of a squared plus b squared is one. For example, we can take vector one zero which is i. And that's, that's this yellow vector which I drew at the beginning, which is parallel to the x, which goes along the x-axis. That corresponds to the direction along the x-axis, right? Or we can take 0, 1, which is a vector j. Both of them are unit vectors, certainly. These are not all pos possible direction vectors. We could take, for example, 1 over square root of 2, 1 over square root of 2. That would also have length 1, and it will be a vector which goes, which has angle 45 degrees to the x-axis. So it's a kind of a bisectoral vector. It goes sort of in the middle between x and y. Or you can take square root of 3 over 2, 1 half. So that's a vector which has an angle 30 degrees to the x-axis, right? And so on. So there are many more. So let's suppose we've chosen such a vector. Let's call it u. Let's call this u. u for unit, unit vector. Unit meaning that it has length 1 or norm 1. So now we would like to define, introduce the notion of rate of change, rate of change with respect to this vector. So the direction, and this is what we'll call directional derivative. Directional derivative. So maybe at this point, actually, to, I would like to I would like to adjust my notation to uh, to emphasize that I would like to I would like to choose a particular point x zero y zero. I haven't done this. I didn't do it earlier, but I think that it's better to do it because otherwise we'll be 
will be confused later on as to what, what, what stands for a variable and what stands for a particular value, particular uh, coordinate of a point. So likewise here I would have a y0 and x0, x0 and y0, and here y0. And here I made a mistake, y0. Okay. All right, so let's just do that to, to be sort of on the safe side. So directional derivative, I add the point x0, y0. Add, add the point x0, y0. In the direction u, direction u is the rate of change, a uh, direction derivative of f, of a function f, is the rate of change, is the rate of change of f in the direction u. And it is defined in the same way as before. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to let my point move in the direction u, which means that I would say that x0, so the vector x, let me draw it again so that this will be vector x, x0, y0. And this will be the dir direction vector AB, OK? So I would like to move in this direction, which means that I take the vector x0, y0, the position vector of my point, and I add this, un this unit vector with some multiple, h. h will be a small number, because I don't want to use epsilon, right? So I'll use h. But you can, you can use any letter you want. But this is going to be, this h will play the role of this delta x or delta y in the earlier formulas. But I don't want to use delta x or delta y because we are now not differentiating with respect to x or y. We are doing kind of a mixed derivative. So that's why we are actually changing both x and y. So this is going to be h a and y 0 plus h b. So you see. This unit vector has two components, a, b. So, so changing the original point by, in this direction by h means that we change x0, the first coordinate, by h, a, and the second coordinate, y0, by h, b. <coughs> so that's, that this, these are going to be the arguments which I will substitute in f. So that's going to be x0 plus h, a and then y0 plus hb. So that's a new value. That's, that's a new point, and that's a new value. Mine is the old value at x0, y0. And then I will divide by h. So you see, if I chose, if I chose ab to be 1, 0, the, the vector which goes in the x direction only and I denoted h by delta x, then this formula would become this formula because x0 would change by just delta x, which now I call h. y0 will not change at all because the second component would be 0. So I would get exactly this formula. If, on the other hand, I chose, so we get df dx. If I chose this to be, 0, 1, and h to be delta y, then we would get, we would get df, df dy, right? For the same reason, because in that case, if my, if my direction vector is 0, 1, x, x is not changing, but y is changing by h, which we can then call delta y, and then we'll exactly recover this formula. So what I've written is a, is a generalization of both formulas where I am allowed, I'm, I'm changing both x and y at the same time, but in a controlled way along a given vector. So the increment is not random, but it depends on one parameter h. And it looks like this, h a, h b. That's exactly, geometrically, that exactly means that we are moving away from this point in this direction. OK, is that clear? Any questions? Okay, 
So clearly then, what we are calculating is the, is the increment of the function in this direction. And when we divide by the increment of uh, along, the, you know, along this path or along this line, h, we get the rate of change. And for a given finite h, it's going to be an approximation to the actual rate of change. And, but if we take the limit, provided that the limit exists, of course, which we are assuming here, if we take the limit, h goes to zero, we end up with the instantaneous rate of change at that very moment, in that, or more precisely, at that very point, x0, zero, y0. Zero. And that's the directional derivative. And we call it d sub u of f at x0, zero, y0. Zero. That's a notation. By definition, this is the definition. Okay. So w once again, examples examples are d for the vector i for the vector i is just f sub x x zero y zero. And for the vector j, it, f, it is the second partial derivative. But this is a kind of a mixture. Okay? So now, what is it equal to? Uh, can we calculate it uh, by using uh, a rule similar to the rules we used for, for partial derivatives? For partial derivatives, we could calculate them rather easily. That's right. OK, so uh, here is the question. The question is, here's the question. What do, this, what, do this, what do the points of this form represent on the plane, right? Or this, more precisely, these points on the plane. Because I'm evaluating now my function f at points of this form, x0 plus ha, y0 plus hb, right? That's what I'm doing here. And I'm subtracting, right? So it's natural to ask, these points, where do they lie, these points? Well, I rewrite this as a sum of two vectors. One is the position vector of the initial point, x0, y0. And the second is h times u, right? Let's separate two questions. First question is about what those points represent, right? So first of all, the set of points of this form where h is a real number is the line which passes through this point in the direction of this vector u. So this is something which I didn't even mention because I assume that this is somehow obvious, right? Because this is exactly how we got equations of parametric equations for lines a few weeks ago. When we got equations for, parametric equations for lines a few weeks ago, we also took the initial vector, uh, the, sorry, the position vector of the initial point plus h times what we called v. So this u now plays the role of v. And instead of h, we usually write t, but it doesn't matter, right? So, that's, so this is precisely the form of the line which passes through this point in the direction of this vector u. Uh, of course, we did it mostly on, in R3, in space, and now I'm doing it on the plane, but the result is the same, it's similar. There are only two coordinates instead of three, but otherwise it's the same, okay? So that, that should be clear, that, that this, this points, all of these points lie on this line. The line obtained by moving away from this point in, this, in the direction of this vector, or the opposite direction, for that matter, okay? So that's the first question. The second question is, why do we take the limit when h goes to zero? For the same reason why we took the limit when delta x goes to zero, delta y goes to zero. If we don't take the limit, we get an approximation to the rate of change. It's like a car is moving, and you take the distance it has traveled in, uh, over one se uh, you know, uh, over in a period of one second, and divide by, by one, okay? What do you get? Well, the, even during this one second, it goes faster and slower, so it is an approximation to its velocity during that time. But if you do it over one hundredth of a second, it's going to be even closer to a closer approximation and so on. So if you're really interested in the instantaneous velocity of the car, at that very moment, you have to take the limit. Well, if you start from zero, make it at the smallest possible, forget the smallest 
That's right. That's right. That's right. But I'm dividing. You see, I'm dividing distance by time. Of course, if I didn't divide by time, think of H as time. The car is moving in this direction. The analogy with the car is much better for a function with one variable, but never mind. If you don't divide by h, you'll just get 0 when h goes to 0. Right? So this, the numerator becomes very small, and the denominator becomes very small. But you take the ratio, and you capture the rate of change. Right? The rate of change. It's not change. It's the rate of change that we should be living in right now. Right? Because the rate of change means that you take the, increment, the difference between the values of the function, and you divide uh, by the difference in the arguments. The point is that now we have two arguments. So we cannot, we cannot just take the point, this point minus this point, right? We have to take, we have to choose a particular direction. And, uh, and H is the, H is the, is the is a, would, would then control the increment in that direction. Okay. So I hope it's, I hope it's clear now. Now, so this, this is a setup. This is a setup. This is a definition of the directional derivative, which I, is kind of is very geometric. But now I want to get an algebraic answer for it, because I don't want to each time take the limit and, and, and try to figure out what this limit is equal to. I would like to have an efficient computational tool for this. So when you get this problem on homework, if you want to, you're asked to calculate the directional derivative, you want to get the answer very quickly. right? And To get the answer, we have to to get the answer. We have to to use a tool which is actually very useful on its own, on its own right, which is called chain rule. So to calculate it, we we use a chain rule. Computed. Use chain rule. So what is a chain rule? So chain rule is something you learned already. You've learned already in the case of a function one variable, which is that suppose you have a function one variable f of x, but x is also a function of some variable t, right? And suppose you want to calculate the derivative of, of f with respect to t, right? And so the result is that it's going to be df dx times dx dt. And now you can appreciate how easy it is to prove this formula if you really understand what the differential is, which is what I explained a couple of weeks ago, right? I explained what the differential is. So if the function is differentiable, this df makes perfect sense as a certain linear function. And you can, you can apply to these functions like df, dx, and dt the same rules that we apply to everything. And so in particular, we can actually cancel out dx in the numerator and denominator. And that's what this formula really is. This formula is, is, very, um, is very elementary. It's just a statement that you can cancel out this dx, dx is in this form. In, in these fractions. You see? So there's no mystery. I mean, the way maybe it was presented before, it was kind of mysterious. But in fact, there's no mystery. If you, if you make sense uh, out of differential, if you explain what it is, then, um, and the function is differentiable, in other words, the, the df actually can be defined, uh, then um, you can actually apply this rule you can just cancel out this numerator and denominator under suitable conditions, right? So that's the, that's the chain rule in, for one variable. So now let's suppose that you have a function in two variables, f of x, y, okay? But x and y are in turn functions of another variable which we'll call h. So now I would like to calculate what is df dh. So 
So let me, let me draw it in, by the following diagram. So this is f. f is a function of x and y. And x is a function of h, and y is a function of h. So then f becomes a function of h by composition. Right? Because for each value of h, you will have some value of x and some value of y, and then you plug them in into f, and you get some value. So effectively, you get a function of h. Right? So it's like a chain of two functions, or more three functions. There is f, there is this function, and there is this function. And by substituting this functions g1 and g2 into f, you get a new function of h. And once you get a new function of h, you can ask, what is the derivative of this function respect to h? And of course, in all of this, all of this discussion, I'm assuming that this derivative exists, which is, uh, of course, not uh, guaranteed. Certain conditions have to be satisfied for the functions f, g, g1, and g2. But in all of our examples, those conditions will be satisfied. So I'm not, I'm not sort of focusing on those conditions too much. I'm just, going, I'm just trying to explain the formula which we'll get once these conditions are satisfied. And so what is this formula? We have to, we have to compute df dh. Right? How can we do this? Well, we have to remember the formula for df, which we had two weeks ago. And the formula for df was f sub x dx, or actually, let me, let me write it by using this notation. It will be slightly better. Remember that we had two different, uh, two possible notation uh, for the partial derivatives, df dx or f sub x. So I'm just using this one, but it's, it's the same as f sub x dx plus df dy dy. So that's df. Let's substitute in, in this formula. We just need to divide this expression by dh. So we'll just divide it here and here. Right? So what we'll get is df dx dh oh, dx dh plus df dy dy dh. See, so we got a very simple formula for the, for the derivative of f with respect to h. And it's very similar to the old formula. In the old formula, you have to differentiate by x and then x by t. But now there are sort of two channels. There are two channels uh, with respect to which f could depend on h. The first channel is through x, and the second channel is through y. So through x, it, it depends in this way. You have to take the partial derivative of x with respect to x, and, uh, and then the derivative of x with respect to h. And through the second channel, you get the second uh, term. But it's very, uh, it's very easy to remember if you, if you draw a diagram like this. Note that in this formula, I cannot, I cannot cancel these guys out, because while dx actually makes perfect sense as a differential, this curly d f or dx doesn't make sense by itself, right? I think I explained this when we talked about partial derivatives. The notation is just for the ratio, and it is a partial derivative. But the, this and this by itself doesn't make sense. So I can't prove this formula by, by canceling out things in denominator, uh, numerators and, and denominators. Instead, I'm proving this formula by using the formula for the differential, and I'm just dividing this formula by dh. When I divide on the left-hand side, I get this expression. When I divide on the right-hand side, I replace dx by dx dh. I replace dy by dy dh. That's the formula I get, OK? So that's the formula for, um, for the derivative when you have this chain of functions. Why am I explaining all this? Because I claim that to calculate, I can calculate the formula for the directional derivative by using precisely this rule for the following reason. I can think of this, of this function, as a function in, um, uh, which is obtained in, the same, in this way. Namely, I will just say, <laughs> the 
that I have a function f of xy. And then I will have x is equal to um, x0 plus ha, and y is equal to y0 plus hb. Right? So this is what I called in this general setup by g1 of h <coughs> and g2 of h. This is g1 of h, and this is g2 of h. They're very simple. They're just, I just take them from the, um, from the formula for the directional derivative. So now I can apply this rule. So the, and the point is that du of f at x0, y0 is exactly df dh, in which then I substitute h is equal to 0, right? Because what I'm doing is I'm just taking this function, the composition of these functions, when exactly this, that I have uh, you know, f in which I substitute x0 plus ah and y0 plus bh. And I take its derivative at 0. Taking derivative at 0 precisely means that I, I subtract the value at h equals 0, and the value at h equals 0 is exactly x0, y0, which is what I have, and I divide by h and I take the limit. So, so this is just rewriting this ratio. This ratio can be considered as, as a derivative of this, compo of this composition of functions at h equals 0. But now I can calculate this derivative by using the chain rule. Right? So I use the chain rule. So what do I get? I have to get, which is just this formula. So I just get df dx times dx dh. What is dx dh? Hmm? A, that's right. This is a linear function in h because x0 is fixed, right? x0 is a constant, a is a constant, and h is a, is a variable. I view this expression as a function of h. It's a linear function. We're used to this kind of things. Uh, when we talk about equations for lines, we would have x0 plus um, uh, ta, for example, right? So, but usually we would call our variables x, y, z, or t. Now the fancy thing is that I'm using this letter h for the variable, but of course we realize that we can use any variable. The reason why I'm using h is because, in some sense, it's an auxiliary variable, so I, I don't want to mix it with the other variables we've used because in some sense it plays a very special role here. And also in the book, is the letter H is used. So in other words, there are some reasons for using H which have nothing to do with the subject matter, right? It's, it's just a matter of uh, convenience or custom and so on. And if you view this as a function of H, it's just a linear function in H, and as such, its derivative is just A. It's just the coefficient in front of H. So this is A. Oh, I'm sorry, this is A. This. Um, let me just write it here. dx dh is a. And likewise, dy dh is b. So therefore, the second term is df dy times b. So finally, we get the formula for the directional derivative. Directional derivative with respect to a general vector d, uh, u, which is ab, is just, and I want to write it a slightly different way, uh, a times, oh, it doesn't matter, I can write in this order, fx of x0, y0 times a plus f sub y, x0, y0 times b. just this formula, but now I switch back to the old notation f sub x, f sub y. The reason why I use this notation for chain rule is because if you write it in this way, it's easier to remember the formula because you can kind of remember that almost, it's as though you could actually cancel them out, even though you can't, but it's a kind of a useful rule to just memorize the formula. But now it's sort of, 
more convenient to, to use the old notation because I wanted to, to emphasize that it looks very similar to the old formulas for partial derivatives, which I, which I wrote here. So in fact, there is no mystery. The rate of change, the rate of change in the general vector is a combination of the rates of change in the x direction and the y direction. And in retrospect, what else could it be? I mean, if you look at this formula, you see that it's very natural. Suppose you already know the rate of change in the x direction and you know the rate of change in the y direction. What will be the rate of change sort of in the middle if you go 45 degrees to x and y? Well, clearly it will be, it will be just um, sort of a com combination with equal coefficients, right? Both of them will contribute in the same way. The, the point is like which, which coefficients should we choose? Well, the coefficients we choose will be coefficients of the unit vector. So the square root of a squared plus b squared is one. That's how we agree from the beginning to define direction by unit vectors. And so then we use those components as the weighting factors. You, you can think of this as the weighting factors. Each of the two partial derivatives contributes to the rate of change in the, with respect to the vector a, b. And they contribute with the weighting factors a and b. In other words, if a is greater than b, then this, the first partial derivative will contribute more and will contribute exactly proportionally to the difference between, to the ratio between a and b. So that's the formula that we get. This is the formula for the direction derivative. Okay. And now we can, first of all, calculate direction derivatives in practical situations, okay? And we can also discuss the following question. In which direction, in which direction, u, do we achieve the largest or, or the smallest rate of change? Right. So the key to answering this last question is to understand that this looks like dot product. And it is actually dot product, right? Because we have already a and b as a vector, the components of a vector, namely the vector u, our unit vector. And then if we put the two partial derivatives together as components of another vector, okay, we can then see that this formula is actually nothing but the dot product between these two vectors. Right. So let me take the two partial derivatives and put them together as components of a vector. A very natural thing to do. You'd think, why, have, why haven't we thought about this before? It's the most natural thing to do. Because we know that when we have, you know, to get, to get a vector, say, on a plane, we need two, we need two uh, components. And here there are two natural components because there are two partial derivatives, x and y. So why not put them all uh, together into a one single vector? That's this vector. And then we have our vector u. If we take the dot product between them, we'll get precisely this expression, obviously. So this is a dot product between our original direction vector and some other vector. So it looks like this vector is important, okay? So we have, and in fact, we'll introduce a notation for, and terminology for it. This vector is called the gradient vector. Gradient vector. Um, for the function f at the point x0, y0. And we will introduce a notation for it. Noble f. And to emphasize that it's a vector, we put an arrow, an arrow like this. Okay, so the, this is a gradient vector. So what have we learned so far? We have learned that first of all, in addition to, to two partial derivatives we, for functions into variables that we have studied before, there are also derivatives with respect to a given direction vector, which we choose to be a unit vector u with co components a and b. That this, this derivative is nothing but the rate of change in the direction u. It's given by this formula. 
it can also be thought of as a, as a derivative of the function f with respect to some auxiliary variable h if we write x and y as functions of h in this way. And finally, we have a formula for this directional derivative as a dot product between our original vector a, b, the, the direction vector a, a, b, and another vector which is determined by the function f and the points x0, y0. This vector is just, has two components which are nothing but the partial derivatives. This vector is called the gradient vector. Okay. So what is the geometric significance? So you ask, what, what does this formula mean? What is the geometric significance of this vector? And, and how can we use this, this formula to answer various questions about the rate of change of our function? Okay, and here we ha this, uh, I have to explain a very important interpretation, geometric interpretation of this gradient vector. And the interpretation is that this vector, this is a normal vector. This is in fact a normal vector to the level curve of f at the point x0, y0. Okay, so let me, let me explain this. Yeah, bless you, exactly. I'm just thinking if this blackboard is big enough for me, maybe I should, for this, let me save it for something else. Let me, let me go. Let me use a bigger one. So first of all, uh, let's recall, let's talk about level curves. We have a function in two variables, which has a graph, okay? So for instance, so let's say it's an elliptic paraboloid or something like this. Now, when I want to draw it, to give, it, to give the illusion of, of it being 3D instead of 2D, what I usually do is I draw the circles, right? To give the illusion of three-dimensionality. What are the circles? These are the level curves. These are the curves which we get by intersecting this graph by a plane parallel to the xy plane. So for instance, for instance, this is intersection, intersection of the graph with a plane z equals some, let's call it z0. So let's say our point, our point could be somewhere here. That's our point x0 and y0. And this is the value. This is the value of, of the function at this point. So we'll call it z0. So z0 is actually f of x0, y0. But now we look at all points on the same graph which share this value of z. What does it mean? It means that we just cut it by, by a horizontal plane which is at the level z0. That's why we call it the level curve, because this is a level. It corresponds to a fixed level of the function. Okay. So, in other words, this is a curve which is given by the equation. The equation for this curve is f of xy is equal to z0. Now, let's be a little bit more precise. The level curve actually lives in space, right? The level curve is uh, in the three-dimensional space. It does not belong to the xy plane, usually, unless the level is zero. If the level is zero, then of course it will be part of the xy plane. What I've written here, on the other hand, is a curve on the xy plane, right? So to say that this is the equation for the level curve is not strictly speaking correct. More precisely, this is the equation of the curve which I obtained by dropping this level curve onto the xy plane. In other words, 
what I can do is I can just drop this, take the projection of this level curve onto the xy plane. So it has exactly the same shape. So in this case, let's say it's a, it's a circle, let's say, or maybe an ellipse if you want a more general elliptic paraboloid. And so this is going to be exactly the same circle of the same radius or the same ellipse, except that this guy was living at level z0 and I just dropped it to level zero. So it's now it's, it's on the xy plane. So oftentimes, when we talk about level curves, we will not distinguish between the level curves as the curve which lives on the graph and its projection onto the xy plane. Because in some sense, once you cut it by the, by the plane parallel to the xy, xy plane, it sort of lost its three-dimensionality. It's become an object which is better to think of as an object in the two-dimensional ambient space. So to be exactly correct, we would have to say that this curve living as living on the graph itself in the three-dimensional space is defined by two equations. The first equation is z equals z0. That defines the level. That's this plane by which we cut, cut this graph, right? Plus the equation f of xy equals z0. But oftentimes we'll forget about this and just look at the projection at the corresponding curve on the xy plane. So that's the level curve. And now what I'm claiming except the way I drew it is not, um, it's not very good because <laughs> it would have to go through the point x0, y0. And uh, my picture is very misleading, in fact. Right? So I, it has to, be, has, to be more like, has to be more like this. The question is, what do we want? Something that looks more beautiful or something that is correct? So I, I, I'm afraid we have to do something that's I have to do the correct one instead of the beautiful one. So maybe let me just erase it and do it. Didn't do a good job at the beginning. Like this. Something like this. As long as I don't put, make any sharp corners, I think this is okay. Okay? So yeah, so this is very important, of course. That this curve has to go through the point x0, y0, because this was the original point on the level curve. That's, how, that's why we talk about the level curve to begin with, because of this point. We look at all other points which share the same value of the function. OK. And so now what I'm claiming is that if you draw the gradient vector, if you draw the gradient vector, nabla, starting at this point, then it will be exactly perpendicular to this level curve, which is, which is to say that it's, it's perpendicular to the tangent line to this point. <clears throat> and that's the geometrical significance of this gradient vector. Okay. So now, so he, now we're getting in, in a kind of a confusing territory because now we're going to have an interplay between different objects, between tangent lines, tangent planes, and various normal vectors. So I want to sort of set it all straight for you. So this is the first result that I'm going to emphasize, which is that this gradient vector that we discussed, f sub x and f sub y, is normal to this curve. It's perpendicular, which is what I wrote here. Normal vector to the level curve of x at x0, y0, given by the equation, by the equation, f of x, y equals z, zero, right? So this is the first fact. Now, I want to, I want to relate this fact to another fact which, is, uh, which, we understood, which we realized two weeks ago about tangent planes to the graph. And the, that fact is the following, that the vector f sub x at x0, y0, f sub y at x0, y0, and negative 1 is a normal vector, is a normal vector to the tangent plane. To the graph of f at the point x0, y0. Okay? 
And I want to explain that these two things are very closely related to each other. And in fact, one implies the other. So you see, and this is a very important point to understand, that at this, we look at this graph, and we have this point on the graph, okay? We have this point on this graph. Because the graph itself is two-dimensional, there is a tangent plane to the graph, which I'm not going to try to draw, but it is like this, right? Tangent plane to the graph. So in fact, let me use this as a model. Let me use this as a model for it, okay? In other words, I will not have the paraboloid. You have to, you'll have to imagine the paraboloid somewhere here, right? This, but this, think of this as a tangent plane, which is missing on that picture because it would be too messy to make. So this is a tangent plane, okay? And the paraboloid goes like this. Remember, I brought a vase last time or whenever, two weeks ago. So there is this paraboloid which goes like this. And this plane touches the paraboloid that paraboloid at one point, let's say at this point. So this is the fact number one. Fact number two, the paraboloid has a level curve which passes through this point, which would be a circle going like this. The levels will be parallel to the floor, right? So the level will be, it's just going to be the plane which is parallel to the floor, which goes through this point. It will cut the paraboloid over a circle. It will make a circle out of the paraboloid. And Therefore, we will get a curve on the, on the graph, this circle, okay? Now, the, the, this plane touches the whole graph, and in particular, it touches the, the level curve. But inside this plane, I will have a line which is specifically tangent to, to the level curve. So this is a tangent line to the level curve. You see what I mean? On this picture, on this picture, I drew this tangent line downstairs because what all, what, the other thing I did is I dropped the level curve onto the xy plane and then I drew the, the tangent line, this tangent line. But now let me draw this tangent line right here. So th this white tangent line is that tangent line over there, okay? I hope uh, this makes sense. Okay, but now the point is that this tangent line belongs to the tangent plane. You see that there are two tangent things. There is a tangent plane to the whole graph, and there is a tangent line to just the level curve. But the level curve is part of the graph, so its tangent line has to be part to the tangent thing to everything, which is the tangent plane. That's why I drew that line. I drew that line on this tangent plane. And now let's talk about normals. The normal vector to the entire tangent plane we discussed last time, or whatever, two weeks ago. And that's the vector which has f sub x, f sub y, and negative one, right? When we use that normal vector to write down the equation of the tangent plane, which was like z minus z zero is equal to fx, and so on, right? So this we knew, this we knew from before. That's the, that's the, uh, that's the normal vector. But now I want to talk about the normal vector to just the tangent, to the tangent line to the level curve, which is not the same thing, you see, because this vector has three components because it's a normal vector to a plane in space, right? It has three components. But now I want to talk about the normal vector to the curve. And again, this curve can be thought of in two, it has sort of two different incarnations. One is the curve which lives on the graph itself. So it sort of lives, it's elevated over the xy plane. And then there is this tangent line. So really this tangent line, my, my picture is terrible because these two have to parallel, of course, right? It's my worst, worst drawing uh, so, uh, so far. Uh, imagine that these two are parallel, okay? It looks like non-Euclidean non -Euclidean geometry. The parallel lines intersect. They shouldn't. So, but anyway, I don't want to waste more time redrawing. So let's just, just trust my word. They are parallel to each other, okay? Even though it doesn't look this way. So 
I think the most confusing aspect of this whole story, the story is incredibly elementary, but the reason I'm explaining to you because in my experience, many people find this confusing. And I think the main reason why people find it confusing is because there are two ways to think about the level curve. One is to think about level curve as being part of the graph, which in some sense is, a, is the right way because it, that's how it was defined. It was defined by intersecting the graph with the plane. But then we realize that you know, once you do that, the z variable effectively disappears. So we might as well think of it as a, as a, cur as a curve on the xy plane. Even better, let's think of this plane as being the xy plane. And then, it, actually, we don't have to move it back and forth. Just think of, of this as being a plane with two coordinates, x and y, and no z coordinate, OK? So as such, this curve has a tangent, tangent line, OK? And the question is, what is the equation of this tangent line? That's what, I'm, that's what I'm, I'm getting at. So the equation of the tangent line, the equation of the tangent line, we can obtain very easily from the equation of the tangent plane. Because let me remind you the equation for the tangent plane. Equation for the tangent plane. The equation for the tangent plane is like this. z minus z0 is equal to f sub x, x0, y0, times x minus x0, plus f sub y. Right? That's the equation, which we have discussed many times, and it was on the, even, even on the midterm. Right? And of course. Saying that that's the equation of the tangent plane is precisely saying that this is a normal vector, right? Because these are the components, f sub x, f sub y, and negative 1. Why negative 1? Because if you take this to the right-hand side, you will see that z minus z0 appears with coefficient negative 1, right? So that's the negative, that's this negative 1. This negative 1 is here because we have this term, z minus z0. Okay. So that's the equation of the tangent plane. And now I would like to write down the equation for the tangent line to the level curve inside this plane. What should I do for this? Well, on the level curve, z is equal to z0. I mean, that's the definition of the level curve. So on the level curve, z is just identically equal to z0. Everywhere on this level curve, z is equal to z0. Right? So this has to drop out. This has to disappear. And then we'll get the equation of the, of the, of the part which is tangent to just a level curve. So therefore, the equation of the tangent line, of tangent line to uh, the level curve is f sub x of x0, y0 times x minus x0 plus f sub y of x0, y0 times y minus y0 is 0. That's the equation of the, ta of the tangent. So uh, let me remind you that these are numbers, right? These are the numbers, two numbers. And these are the variables. So we have x minus x0, y minus y0. And what are these two numbers? These two numbers are precisely the components of the gradient vector. Precisely the components of the gradient vector. In other words, you see, in the equation of the tangent plane, we have the two partial derivatives. But we also have this negative 1, which comes because of this term, z minus z0. Right? But once we look, when we, when we focus on the, on the level curve, this z minus z0 disappears. So the only information which is left is the two partial derivatives, fx and fy. And we get the equation for the, for the tangent line to this level curve. OK? Any questions about this? Yes? That's right. It's on the xy plane. Exactly. 
So I want to do I want to do the analysis of everything related to the level curve on the xy plane. Strictly speaking, each time I would have to add the equation z equals z0 to indicate that actually this plane is elevated to that level z0. But usually we don't do that. We just kind of skip that. Okay? But this has to be understood. You either have to think that you're here, but then each time you have to write, add the equation z equals z0. Or you, could, should, you can just say, OK, we are just thinking about X, y, about dropping everything onto the xy plane, okay? But now this equation is very suggestive because this equation is just like the equations of planes that we are used to writing, right? So I claim that this equation, <laughs> this equation precisely means that this is a normal vector to this line. So therefore, E is the normal vector to the, to the tangent line, to, to this tangent line. To this tangent line, which is illustrated by this picture. This yellow vector is the gradient vector, which is, this is a gradient vector, right? This is the, it is perpendicular to the tangent line, or normal to the tangent line. But to say normal to the tangent line is the same as saying normal to the curve itself, right? We don't distinguish between being normal to the curve and being normal to the tangent line. It's the same thing. Because it's something about just a very small neighborhood. So linear approximation is good enough for this. Why is that a normal vector? That's actually something we should have, we should have talked about before, which, but we didn't. So let me, this is sort of a, uh, a digression. What is a general equation of a line on the plane? So actually, let me do it by, as a kind of analogy, OK? Here we'll look at planes in R3. And here we will talk about lines on, in R2. What is the equation? What is the general equation of a plane in R3? This we know very well. A x minus x0 plus b y minus y0 plus c, z minus z0 equals 0, OK? Let me emphasize this a, b, and c. What are this a, b, and c? a, b, and c are components of the normal vector. Normal vector to this plane. For a good reason, which we explained, you know, when we talked about planes. Now I want to to express um, lines in R2 in the same way, and I claim that a line, a general line in R2, can be written exactly the same way, except I don't have the last the, the last term because there's no z. So a times x minus x zero plus b times y minus y zero. Zero. I claim that just like this is an equation of a plane in R3, this is an equation of a line in R2 for the same reason. It's actually simpler because it's, it's a line in, in two-dimensional space as opposed to a plane. But we never talked about this somehow because, because, well, usually we talk about lines as given by equation y equals kx plus b or something. But actually, that's not the most general equation because what if you don't have a coefficient in front of y. What if you have a, it doesn't uh, take care of the vertical lines. So this is the most general formula for a line in R2, which allows vertical, horizontal lines, whatever. And of course, if you believe in this formula, you've got to believe in this formula. Because first of all, you get this formula by setting z equals 0. This line is a level curve of this plane at z equals 0, right? So that's obvious. 
That's obviously the case. But then if you believe in this, you also have to believe the fact that a and b, if you take these two coefficients, a and b, that this is a normal vector to this line. This is a normal vector to this line. Okay? A, B, C was normal vector to the plane. A and B is a normal vector to the line. But now, my line here, my tangent line, which I'm trying to kind of explain that it's very important, is given by this formula, which is exactly like this formula, where A, this is A, and this is B, right? If so, then the corresponding vector, A, B, is a normal vector to that line. And that's the gradient. So I have proved that this statement one, that the gradient is a normal vector to the level curve. Okay? So there are two important vectors which show up when you have a graph of a function. One is a normal to the, to the plane, to the entire tangent plane. And the other one is normal to, to, the, to the tangent line to the level curve, which is a vector that is parallel to the floor, parallel to the xy plane. And there is a very simple connection between them. The first of them has three components because it's a vector in three space, which are fx, fy, and negative one. And the second one is obtained from this one by chopping off this negative one. And when you do that, what's left is just This one is going to, ah, no, it's better, okay. All right. Hopefully it will survive the next five minutes. Okay, so, so let me repeat this for our uh, worldwide uh, viewing audience. We shouldn't forget them. This negative one is important, okay? The negative one is because the equation of the plane had if, if we put z and minus z zero to the same side of the equation, it will appear with coefficient negative one. And that's exactly this negative one over there. Okay? And that's the z component of the normal vector. So you see, the point is that the normal vector to the, to the graph is like this. It's tilted. It's not like this. It's not parallel to the floor. It's tilted because the plane is tilted. But the normal vector to, the, to this line is going to be inside the same plane. <clears throat> which is the plane 
that is parallel to the floor. So therefore, it would be like this. What we do, we lose, we lose that negative one. Well, here it appears like it's positive one, but the reason why it's, it's because, in fact, it is like this. It was like this. But if you think about the tangent, the normal vector as being like this, then you will see what I mean. Because the, think about that picture. So this is the, I feel like I wave, I'm waving my hands too much. But if you, if you think about the normal vector as being on this side, which you can't see but you can imagine, then you will see that its, it's z component is negative 1. OK? All right. Now, so now hopefully we understand the geometry of this whole thing. So let's do a, let's do a small. Let's do a uh, small exercise. Let's do a small exercise. Suppose that f of x, y is x cubed minus 4x squared y plus y squared. And the first question is to compute the directional derivative with respect to the vector u, which is um, 3 fifth and 4 fifth at the point 0, negative 1. So see, these are x0 and y0, and these are a and b. Let me call them. These are not the same a and b, though. Maybe not. Uh, let me not use a and b now, because at the beginning, I used a and b as, as components of the vector u. But uh, now I'm using, in, the, in my later discussion, I was using a and b as components of the normal, of the normal vector. So let's just not. OK, so what, what do we need to do for this? Well, we need to find the gradient vector, because the directional derivative of f at this point is the dot product of the gradient at this point and the vector u. So u we are given, the vector u we are given, so we need to calculate the gradient vector. And the gradient vector consists of the two partial derivatives, right? So we need to calculate f sub x is equal to 3x squared minus 8y. And f sub y is minus 4x squared plus 2y. And then we, we calculate them at this point. So here we get 8. And here we get, um, yes? That's right, x, y. Thank you. I'm, gl I'm glad some, uh, somebody's paying attention. That's good. So this is 0, actually, here, right? This is 0. And second one, I think I got, did I get it right? I got it right. So that's going to be negative 2, right? So the dot product is going to be between 0, negative 2, and this one, which is 3 fifths and 4 fifths. And by the way, note that this is indeed a unit vector. If you take this squared plus this squared, you'll get 1, right? So now we take the dot product, and the dot product is minus 8 over 5. So that's the answer for, for the rate of change or directional derivative in this direction. Now, another question which will, you will also encounter is the following. In which direction? Is the directional derivative take, does the directional derivative take the maximal possible value? Okay? And for this, you have to find u for which this dot product will give you the maximal possible value. Right? You see, you cannot change this vector. This is just this is a gradient vector. Once your point is given, this vector is fixed. But the direction you can travel any direction you want. So you can ask. Given this vector, in which vector, which vector will give you the maximal possible dot product? Okay. 
And of course, we know that the dot product is equal to the product of the lengths times the cosine. So to maximize the dot product, we have to, say, we have to maximize the cosine. And the maximize cosine means the cosine is equal to 1, or negative 1 if you think in terms of the absolute values. And so, so that means that the, 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 the vector, the direction vector, has to be the unit vector in the direction of the gradient. Okay? So that's how you solve this second part. Okay. I'm out of time, so we'll continue on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs>